dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. So far in this series on the four anchors, we've looked at how God is the secret to human success, how this is expressed firstly by the family being anchored in God, and how it's extended by our work being anchored in our family. In this next conference, I take a look at how our culture stands to benefit by being firmly anchored into our work and the key role that Catholic business leaders play in transforming the culture by bringing the values of the gospel through their families, through their workplace, into the heart of society. All right, everybody, I want to talk with you today about a subject that's a little bit delicate, right? Because I want to try to understand really what's at the origins of our culture. What's at the origins of the way that we do things and the values that guide our decisions in general, right? In our society or in our little subcultures in the world that's around us. So if you take any time you have a human institution, like a school or a group or a family, you're going to have not only something that they do, like a what, but you're going to have a way that they do it, like a how. And the culture is that describes the how of the human life of a given group, an entity. So you've got, in general, French culture, Spanish culture, you know, and then you could go down into the various cities. You've got the culture of Philadelphia, which is different than the culture in Toledo, right, for example. Or if you go even further down, you could talk about the culture in certain parishes and communities that are vastly different one from the other. As we go from one parish to the other, looking for the culture that fits us, Right? Anytime you've got a group of human beings, you're going to have a unity that's doing something that that's exists for some purpose. And part of that is also going to be how they accomplish it. Okay? So when I talk about cultural leadership, we're, we're looking at a lot of phenomenon in our world that people are very sensitive about. Right? So the language that we should allow on television or the way that we express romance and romantic uh, feelings for one another, the, the clothes that we choose to wear, the, the dancing that we, that we choose to engage in and, and how the different cultural norms that exist, you see, on how we choose to live. And these norms, well, they're going to come from somewhere. They're going to come either from the church or they're going to come from the families or they're going to come from some other group, right? It could be new cultural norms that are imposed upon the world by groups that have political power in the given entity. Whatever that might be, you can kind of see like it's touch points that make people very sensitive because on the one hand, culture comes from the family. Foundationally, this is the most important place where a culture a culture is expressed, right? And, and families have a right that's given to them by God, the authority of the parents that can never be replaced by any state uh, precisely to set the cultural expectations, the how of human life for the human beings that are part of that family. So we can understand that like really when we want to look at what where a culture comes from or cultural norms should come from, Well, they should come from the the family and the freedom of the individuals that is rooted in God and the authority that he gives to parents to parent their children. So therefore, it can get really touchy because you can see that anytime a state comes in and says, well, parents, you don't know what you're doing. uh, Parents can get upset about this or at least feel like their rights have been abrogated. And sometimes, though, it's almost necessary because you have so many examples of parents that really aren't parenting very well or, or where children's rights aren't being really guaranteed because their family situation is, is negligent or abusive or broken in different ways. And so it becomes very complex. I mean, how do you make sure that good things happen in families if the state can't step in at time and, and override the rights of the parents? Well, but then again, if you override the rights of the parents, then how can you guarantee that the state's political ends aren't actually being served 
instead of the truth about the human person, which is guaranteed only by the parents, right? So, and it, it, it's difficult and very complex, and I want to recognize that. At the same time, I don't want to lose, for the sake of complexity, the, the, the fact and the truth about how God approaches this situation. He begins in the families and calls families to really em embrace their role as the foundation building blocks of a, the greater society or organizations that they belong to, right? Why? Because only in the family do you get the full picture of the human person. Do you really see a, a way of treating a person over and beyond just their productive norms or the values that they could play with respect to others. I mean, in a family, a child is received 100%. Again, in the ideal. But in the ideal family, that's how it is. Regardless of what they can or can't do or their talents or how smart they are. And the totality of their life is embraced. As long as they're on the earth, they're a member of that family. And therefore, if a family really takes stock of that, they're going to care for and develop that human person to a degree and a depth that, that no state or other institution ever could even come close to doing. And that's therefore why it's so important that the culture in general refers back to family values as the, as the real place to get, get its own initiatives towards developing and helping each of the members of a society, okay? A government should be there to help families and not replace them, right? That's the ideal. And of course, there's a lot of complexity there, but I think you get the message. But to take that an even step further, then when you see that every family, normally speaking, has to include an element of survival, of work, where it extends, the members of the family have to, well, they have to raise the, the, the food on their farm, then they have to harvest the food, and then they have to be able to care for the food. That all entails work just to survive. Or if you're not in a farm environment, well, you need to get a paycheck in order to pay for the school, to pay for the clothes, in order to pay for the food so that you can survive. Work should be a part of that family culture. And I think it's one of the, the, the ways that we deprive our children today, honestly, because we don't give them that value. We act like work is something that they do after college. And that childhood is nothing more than, you know, just going through life, trying to enjoy yourself. And by so doing, though, we deprive our children of an amazing pleasure in life. The pleasure of a job well done. The pleasure of ownership. The pleasure of taking care of your own things, of, of having an identity that's expressed outwardly in, in property and in, in possessions and in the pride that you have seeing your family name written on the side of a barn. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot to that. And, and, and I think we need to do a better job because a family that incorporates the values of work as part of their family infuses the workplace, and this is important, and the heart of the worker with a humanity that allows them to take their place in the world of work with pride and to elevate that work because of the family values that they take into that workplace. In other words, I'm not just going here to get a job. I'm going here as a member of this family with my values expressing who I am in the workplace. I mean, guys, just think about that. I mean, it's, it's the dream of every boss or employer to have fam the people there that come with those types of values because they're going to treat their company with care. They're going to really want it to thrive because that company is an expression of their own personal pride. And their own personal pride has been inculcated in them by the values that they've gotten in their family. This is why if we can incorporate the workspace and anchor it deeply into family values, well, now we've got a recipe for cultural transformation and cultural norming and, and cultural guidance. That's really powerful. Just as a family finds its real understanding of itself and its ability to pass on its identity by being rooted in God, which is the truth, right? We, we come together founded in God and with, as to execute God's plan to populate the earth, right, with, with children and to rear them for heaven. Well, if a family really embraces that and then takes the work experience that they have, you have to have as part of our survival and part of our human life and then f infuses that work experience with those family values that are itself anchored in God, you've got a recipe for a healthy culture. And I want to look at that more in detail with you. Would you like to hear more from Father Nathan? 
Join the St. John Leadership Network and receive a two-minute glance at the gospel every Sunday morning right to your phone. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. All right, so I know many of you are, are out there really just uh, hurting in many ways by what you, you see as cultural transformation gone awry, right? As, as the way that we live as human beings seems to be, become more and more separated from the way that we know God is teaching us to live. If you look at the cultural norms that are given by God in the Bible, and then you look at the cultural norms that are given by the universities, you know, today, or the fraternities on college campuses, you, you can kind of scratch your head and say, boy, we're going towards a different world here. You know, it's almost like two worlds that are colliding. The world is of the Christians, where women are respected, where children are, are, are embraced, where work is done as a, with dignity, where craft and, and the work of our labels of our hands is held in high esteem. You know, and then you've got the world, of, well, that's of not Christians. And we could go through a whole litany of things that we could use to describe it. And I don't think things are as cut and dry as that. And I think sometimes we have to be careful to, you know, not allow ourselves to take on a, an us and them mentality. But yet it's something that, you know, most people today, most Christians today are struggling with because it just seems as if many of our institutions are being operated today in a way that's contrary to the rights of the family and, and the values that a Christian family anyway could rightfully espouse. And so we can find, find ourselves saying, well, is there anything we can do about this? Uh, and, and, and is there any direction we can really take? Where do we look to know the right way because on the one hand, individually, well, we can look towards God. I've got a personal faith in God. But then we feel awkward about what we feel is imposing that faith upon others, right? If I'm in charge of a company, for example, it might be a real challenge for me to tell my workers that I expect them, you know, to do this or this or this type of behavior. So much so that many, many of us don't. Instead, we just let the workspace be dominated by whatever, you know, society says is acceptable. And, and I want to challenge that a little bit because remember when you do that at work, every person who works for your company or is on your management team or is underneath your influence is a member of somebody's family. They're a member of somebody's other clubs and societies. They're a member of our, of our cities at large, which means that the way that they are treated and the way that they behave at the workplace actually will go a long way to determining how they act outside of work including in their homes. And, and this is why I think it's so important, especially for you who have a certain amount of leadership in your small business or your company to bring your Christian values to bear. Because when you do so, you enable your workforce to be working in a healthy and good environment where the best of themselves can be brought up. And by so doing, well, heck, you can purify and heal an otherwise broken person. Imagine if a person could work in that type of great working environment for years. That's going to change their quality of life, how they see themselves, and how they choose to lead their families. I think it's, it's really interesting because as a Catholic priest, of course, I'm a part of a church that spends a lot of focus on family and family life. And I always, I always tell people, this is why I've started to work in the world of business and to try to help to defend Christian businesses. Why? Because if I can defend the business, then I can defend all of the workers whose values are shaped by how they experience the world at their workplace. Many people don't watch all the news and they don't watch all kinds of things that are happening. They live in a world that's shaped and dominated by their need for a job, for security, for financial gain. And they go to their workplace for that, which means this is a place where our society really can norm a lot of behavior. So if you go to a workspace environment where it's okay to, you know, to mistreat women or where it's okay to show disrespect to your, to your elders or where it's okay to, to rip customers off, well, I mean, some people, that's, that's really then how they learn to look at their, their world. And, and I think that that's a real detriment. If on the contrary, we can claim that world of work for Christ, we can protect the freedom of the people that are there to live for something that's greater. 
And again, it doesn't matter about having faith proclaimed in the workplace. It's a matter of the values of, of godliness, the values like respect and honesty and kindness and openness and acceptance and encouragement, this type of clean working environment emotionally that allows our people to thrive. We who are Christians just need to realize that the cultural transformation that we want to see happen for the good in our world will flow through the workplace as one of its key places to be norming the behaviors that we want to see in our world, which is why the enemies of Christ and of, of the gospel want to claim the workplace as their own. And who stands in their way? free Christians who simply refuse to yield the ground because we realize that in many ways culture is originated in the family as its primary place and yet no family's culture is truly healthy unless that culture is really embraced and and shown the way that human work and labor is rooted in the identity of the children and of the people that are in that family and therefore the culture is also rooted in work. And I want to especially focus in on that powerful dynamic, because I think if we look at the anchors of success, I mean, any success needs to be anchored in God because God is infinite goodness, right? So any other measure of success is reductive in the end. I mean, compared to measuring your success by God, right? Who is infinitely good and therefore infinitely intense and infinitely perfect, right? So if you really want to succeed, I mean, it's got to be up to the standards of God. I mean, this, without a doubt, right? And so we say, well, if we're going to do that, then the, the, the most important and foundational aspect of humanity is our family. So let's root that in God, which will do nothing but enhance everything that we do as members of the family. Oh, and that means work. And so then our work needs to be anchored in our family, which is anchored in God. And when we root our ideas and understanding of the productive activity of our labor and our toil into our identity in our families and our family itself and our identity there comes from God, well, then our workspaces are going to, will take on the allure and the shine of something great. Now, in the same way, if we take our culture and our way of acting and we say it needs to be in accord, in alignment with that greatness that we have found in our families and workspaces rooted in God, well, I mean, our culture is going to shine. And that's what I want to show you how to do. How can I, in the, my various spheres of influence, bring those spheres of influence to reflect the dignity, the grace, and the powerful beauty of a working person who is flowing from a, a sacred family that has its foundations in God? I want to give some tips on that. Would you like to start your Thursday mornings with a scriptural leadership lesson? Join the St. John Leadership Network, where Father Nathan hosts a 30-minute call at 6.30 a.m. in all four U.S. time zones. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. All right, so I want to speak to all of you, especially who are concerned about our culture today, concerned about how we're taught to be. Uh, because it, it's something that concerns a lot of a lot of people. If, you know, we look at our school systems and the way that they're changing, how they address things that are very foundational about our self identity, about our sexuality. You know, and, and then you look at universities and how how they're redefining what's acceptable for relationships and and friendships, and 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 you look at how singers and movie stars and and all kinds of forces in our world play themselves out to shape human behavior. And it, it makes you kind of say, my gosh, we need to do something as Christians to do the same thing. And I'm always reminded of that, of that quote by Mother Teresa, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. Right? And of course, because she's right. If we, if we could put our love in our family, there's nothing more powerful to transforming society than, than, than by living in our family. And yet, is there anything more that we could do? How do we raise our voice as Christian leaders to shape the, an impact and influence the, the way that people behave in our world today? And I think it's bigger than just morality, of course. This is the whole sphere of social justice. 
right? Where we try to put place in place organs in society and tools in society and, and policies and ways of being in our world and our political reality as citizens of a, of a, of a republic or citizens of a, of a common venture, social venture. What, what can we do to help the, those who are disenfranchised? Those who otherwise find themselves deprived of justice in different ways. Uh, and, or those who are in justice, but at the same time need extra help in order to advance. Well, in the same way, this, this, it all flows. W what are we going to anchor our efforts in? This is where it's important for folks to realize that the power of thinking and the power of thought. And one of the great treasures of Catholicism, and you could say Christian traditions in general, is that we, we, we deal with ideas. I mean, we are a religion that speaks of truth. And the truth that comes from God is related to us in terms of ideas, notions. Now, this is not always something that's popular with people today. I, I, I meet a lot of people that simply say, oh, well, there's no point in all in those deep thoughts. Or there, why, why should we spend time reading all these complicated books? If you can't say it to me in five seconds, Father Nathan, it doesn't have any value. You know, you have people like that. They'll give you literally 30 seconds on a podcast to say something that they want to hear or also turn the podcast off. And you simply say, my goodness, how far we've, we've, we've fallen from the great intellectual feats that are done in, in pages of writing and the depth of thinking that cannot be replaced. People simply don't have time for it today. And it's, it's you know, always amazing to me. Many people you talk to and they say, we don't have any room for truth. There's no such thing as truth. When you hear people say that, you can always stop them in their tracks by simply asking, wait a second, is it true that there's no such thing as truth? I just want to see. <laughs> you ask them, you know, because if they say, of course, that it's true that there's no such thing as truth, they've contradicted themselves, right? But people are happy to live in that contradiction and just, you know, glibly denying that there's any such thing as truth. But it's like, if there's no such thing as truth, then what are you going to found the, your, your human experiment upon? You know, how do you know that you're living well if there's no way to define well, you know, in truth? If you can't really define what is good, well, then you've deprived my life of any ability to ever achieve it. And people, again, they, they might not want to think that deeply, but we need to think that deeply. And the reason for that is because when we are talking about our culture, it is being normed by something. And here is our great argument. When you talk about human behaviors or what we should allow in our society, what laws should be permit, permitted and what laws should not be encouraged and all this, we got to remember some philosophy is driving it. That it's going to be a philosophy that says that material satisfaction is the only thing that matters or it's going to be a philosophy that says that human pleasure is the only thing that matters or it's going to be a philosophy that says that you know, a human's value is, is measured by the stuff that they can have. Or, or that there's different classes and that the more privileged people should have more and that everyone else should be content with less. I mean, there's all kinds of philosophies that are driving our culture today. And so it's, we shouldn't be ashamed to have one ourselves. And what is the Christian philosophy that says this is what should anchor a culture and, and, and steer its direction? And the Christian philosophy squarely puts our culture on the shoulders of a genuine humanity. A humanity that is made in the image and likeness of God. Anything less is going to deprive the people in that culture of their full of their fulfillment. I cannot live my full dignity out if you take away the fact that I'm made in the image and likeness of God, coming from him and for him. But if, if you put that person in the culture, it doesn't destroy anything of what's normally good in the culture. A genuine humanity is a humanity that enjoys the things of this earth, enjoys basketball games, enjoys music concerts, in, enjoys ice cream cones, right? It's just that we enjoy deeper things as well, like good conversation, like family bonds, like unconditional love, like sacrifice, right? And, and like work that is worth the dignity of the person and challenges the person to give their very best. Work that is an expression of ownership, and that sees what we do as, as an extension of who we are. That's what ownership does. That's why private property is defended by the Catholic Church as a human right. It's because when you transform something by your efforts, you, your ownership of that thing is necessary in order to reveal that that thing reveals you. 
Your genuine humanity is it, what it means to truly live as a human being is defended by the Catholic Church and, and as, as a way to guide what our culture does. And that's why it's so important to anchor our cultural decisions, our political decisions, our, our, our value-based decisions for the general population on, in a culture that esteems the values of work. Because in, in many ways, the, the way that the family reaches out beyond itself into the greater society is through the workplace, through the careers that our children choose, through the, the ways that our, our, our children or our family chooses to shape the world around them. And all of that, and generally speaking, can be seen and described as the world of labor and of work. Well, if that's the case, well, then my culture needs to be influenced by that work in, in a way that, that really enhances it, that brings the culture higher. And how does that happen? Well, let's go back to our anchors. If God is the foundation of everything and the family anchors itself into God, it becomes a place where every member of the family sees themselves in the best light possible. And, that, and then as such, that family necessarily has to work. And so infusing the workplace, not just with necessity, but also with dignity from its members. Well, now the world of work is transformed by being anchored in a family that's anchored in God and a culture that is then influenced through those expressions of the family that are transformative, productive, contributing to the common good that happen economically, of course, with economic benefit and productivity and labor, the world of work. Well, that culture can then be influenced by a true and genuine dignity of the workforce flowing from the family, flowing from God. This is our task. Our task is to make sure that whatever we do influences the world to the most that it can, that we not hold back the beauty of the message of the genuine humanity that we profess and that we espouse and that we embody from the, from the world that we live in. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at communications at stjohninstitute.org. That's communications at stjohninstitute.org. And visit www.stjohninstitute.org and sign up for our newsletter to receive updates from Father Nathan.